Awa, thank you so much for joining us. It's great having you. Uh, we're really looking forward to this keynote session, just a conversation with you. Um, you know, as we are starting this session, tell us where you are and, and what are you doing currently? Well, thank you, Martin, so much for having me. I'm actually down in Gaziantep. So this is in southeastern Turkey. It's one of the areas that was hit by the earthquake. And this is where Inara has its turkey operation effectively. And so obviously our entire office, our staff, uh, everybody was deeply impacted you know, by the earthquake. So I've been spending a lot of time down here just trying to, you know, rebuild the staff and then build it up and build it out because the need is just, I mean, it's overwhelming. And, you know, you know, I mean, I've been to a ton of war zones and everyone keeps saying it, it looks like a war zone. And on the one hand, you know, yes, it does look like a war zone, but there's a big difference in that war doesn't do what this earthquake did in a minute and a half. Tell us in terms of what you see then. I mean, for us here in Singapore, uh, we are so far removed and a lot of what we know of what's happening on the ground are through the lens and the eyes of what you guys are doing and what we see on the news. So maybe you can give us a sense of what's happening on the ground. What do you see? Uh, what are the stories you are hearing? I mean, imagine a large city. Imagine Singapore and imagine, you know, in some places, you know, more than half of it just gone. And as it evaporated, you had lives that were lost. You had people who were trapped underneath the rubble for hours, some of them for days. You have people who are still looking actually for their loved ones because so many bodies were pulled out. They were never identified. So there's all sorts of DNA testing happening. And imagine all of a sudden you've lost everything that connected you effectively to your current life. You've lost your home. You've lost your job. You've lost where your kids go to school. You're living in a tent, but you're also living outside. You're exposed to the elements. It's raining. It's snowing. It's cold. Children are still now, you know, seven weeks after the earthquake happened, eight weeks after the earthquake happened, children are still struggling with so much trauma as are the adults. You know, a lot of adults actually cannot fall asleep until it's 4.17 a.m. That is when the first earthquake struck. And it's almost as if they're too tense to fall asleep until that specific time passes. And then they feel a bit more relaxed and they're able to go to sleep. The trauma is manifesting itself in the children in so many different ways. Some are acting a bit more aggressive. Some are just absolutely terrified. I mean, you have kids who are saying to their parents, I don't want to go inside. I want to stay in a tent because they're afraid of walls. So walls that were meant to provide them that security of home are now a cause for fear. We also have something that we see when we're out in the field doing our distributions, and that is that we get as many requests for diapers for older children as we do for babies. So a lot of kids that, you know, were, were toilet trained are beginning to bed wet again. I mean, the, the enormity of all of this is very difficult to, to sort of verbalize because there's millions of people that have been impacted across hundreds of kilometers of land in Turkey and in Syria. So for you, you wear effectively two hats or or you have two different lands when you look at devastations like this. You have one, which is your profession to a certain extent, um, you know, using media to tell stories, but at the same time, you're also doing relief work. You are a humanitarian organization. So when you look at a devastation like that, how, is, is there like a conflict between these two uh, professions, so to speak? Uh, and how do you navigate that, that uh, conflict, if, if there is any? Um, I personally have not found there to be a conflict because at least for me, you know, I'm not trading one thing for another. I mean, yes, it would be fundamentally wrong to go to somebody and say, tell me your story and I'm going to provide you with humanitarian aid. But what I have sort of tried to do is when I'm wearing the humanitarian hat, I mean, yes, I'm still storytelling, but I am storytelling specifically for a humanitarian cause. And the same rules that apply to me as a journalist apply to me in that space, which is, you know, you always ask if someone's comfortable sharing their story. You always try to make sure that through doing that, you're not inadvertently re-traumatizing them. And you're also really trying to get and capture those core emotions that kind of bind all of us. 
when I've got my pure journalism hat on and I'm going out in the field in these sorts of scenarios, you know, I will go, I will do the reporting, I'll do the storytelling. And then if I find a family that, you know, either Inada can support or another organization that I know of can support, then I will provide them either with the assistance or with, you know, with the contact. So actually, I mean, it's very easy to separate the two and have them not be a conflict. And I know there's this whole thing out there about, you know, journalism and you need to be objective and you need to not interfere, which it's not about being objective when it comes to journalistically telling a story. It's about being fair. And the other thing is, is yes, you know, we are journalists. Yes, I am a journalist, but at the forefront of that, I am a human being. And if a human being in front of me needs help and I can somehow provide that help, that is my main duty towards that person. And what I think you have created is that ability to do something. Um, you know, in the stories that you meet, the people that you meet, and the stories that you tell, you now have the ability to say, you know what, I can do something about it. Um, yeah. I think that's powerful. And, and you know, because you know, I was just thinking about that the other day. So I was in Syria um, kind of wearing these two hats, right? Because I was doing, you know, I, I was getting information and stories for, you know, some reporting I want to do. And at the same time, I was there um, doing a couple of projects that Inada has. And we had gone to this camp that had been flooded. So heavy rains had come in and the camp flooded with this like really red mud water up to everyone's ankles, uh, sorry, up to their knees. And a number of families had lost everything as this sort of tidal wave of flood water came through. And so we went through, we were talking to families that were impacted, but because I'm wearing these two hats, you know, the next day I was able to go back as Inada and say, Hey, you know, like we got you mattresses and blankets and, you know, all of this other stuff and the food that you need. And I remember in that moment being like, this is so amazing. Like, I'm so happy that I was able to actually do something for them right away and being really grateful kind of for this, this role that I have now. It's the video that I think I saw recently on your tweet. Um, and just like during the Ramadan period, it's just really difficult for them. Uh, but just very shortly after you were, you were able to, like you say, bring the relief uh, to the families. And I think one of them asked you, are you going to stay there for the night or something like that? <laughs> And that's a kind of moment that you see everywhere, you know, and they're kind of the moments that don't necessarily make it into the news reporting, but it's just how kind and generous everybody is, you know, it's, it's sort of this ingrained part of the culture. And it's also how they hold on to a certain level of their dignity and their kind of agency over their own life, because, you know, be it war, be it a natural disaster, it takes away a lot of your agency. And by keeping up that hospitality, you know, and they mean it. They genuinely mean it. Like they would have loved for me to be able to stay the night. And quite frankly, I probably would have if I didn't have other stuff, you know, to go do because it was despite the situation that they were in. I mean, we were laughing and we were talking about, you know, things that you wouldn't necessarily expect in that situation. And then what you'll also find kind of in, in this world is the people that have the least are the ones that are willing to give you the very last of whatever it is that they have. That's so true. I mean, we I'm, I'm, we are in this in a room of 200 over uh, social impact leaders, and I'm certain many of them, even in Singapore, would say the same story that the least of us um, often are the ones that would bring into their homes and say, you know what, uh, I don't have a lot, but that's the chicken that I'll cook up for you. Uh, because I think they understand generosity, uh, and I think that's really powerful. Um, you know, when I think about social impact leaders we have in Singapore, um, they do work uh, on the ground, they meet families, they, um, they, they run organizations for youth mental health, migrant workers, and so on. Um, I want to pick your brain a little bit. I mean, you are a journalist, you, but you also run a relief organization, you raise funds, you tell stories. Uh, what are some of the things that, that we should look at when we think about leveraging media to be able to to create some agency among people, to volunteer, to give more. Um, what are things that we should look out for um, when we are telling stories of impact uh, in Singapore? I think a lot of it really centers around, like if you can hone in on what's that one thing when you heard the story that really kind of hit you right here, 
And that's the emotion that you build up on, right? So you build up on whatever it was that connected you to the individual. And, you know, this is kind of the golden rule is take the huge issue and try to dilute it down to one or two people um, and try to dilute it down to a moment that others can relate to, to a certain degree. So for example, you know, we're distributing in our standard kits to the earthquake uh, survivors, we're distributing a children's section that's got Legos and puzzles and this and that in it. And so when we're telling that story, you know, we're focusing in on the case of one child who is sitting there, who has, you know, you know, what was your favorite story you had, your, your favorite toy that you had back at home that now you don't have anymore. And he tells you what that is. And then you see him, you know, opening this kid's kit that we've distributed and maybe his favorite toy isn't in it, but at least he's got something in it. And then you see the transformation in the child's face where he goes from being, you know, quiet and subdued to all of a sudden, you know, he's playing with his Legos and the puzzles and, and the coloring book. And it's really trying to hone in on those sort of collective emotions to the best of one's ability. But then part of it is also about trying to change the narrative, right? So it's not so much the narrative of we are giving this to these people who need help as much as it is look at what they are able to do with the help that we're giving them and talking to them about that, you know? What does it mean to you to be able to have a blanket, uh, cook food, have your child be slightly preoccupied, have access to a doctor? Like, how has this impacted your life so that it's less about what we're doing for them, but more what they're able to do for themselves with the aid that they're receiving? I, I, I like that very much because sometimes when we tell of the impact of the work that we do, uh, we tend to focus on what the organization is doing. Um, I think what you are saying allows us to say, you know what, it is more than just it's more than just what the organization is doing, but the kind of impact that you are creating through the eyes of the beneficiaries or through the eyes of the people you're trying to serve. Exactly. And so, you know, Inada's normal work outside of, you know, this earthquake rapid response that, that we're doing is treating uh, children who have been injured either directly by war or because of circumstances brought on by war, unsafe living conditions and conflict. And we provide medical and mental health uh, treatment for them. And so basically that's, as an example, putting a child in who has severe burn injuries to their face through a number of surgeries. And yes, that's the service that we're providing. But then when we're telling that story and what's actually really important about it is what the child then is able to do with their life. So the focus isn't, you know, oh, we did five surgeries. The focus is this child is now able to go to school. This child now has the inner strength to be able to stand up to bullies, to be able to sort of push through the stairs of strangers. This child now has gone from, you know, being isolated, living in their room at home to interacting with the outside world to again, dreaming of having a future. And so you're presenting the story in a way that also gives that child a certain level or whoever it is who you're talking about agency over how their story is told. And actually one of my favorite questions to ask is how do you want your story told? Like, what do you want your story to be? And you ask that to um, the people you're serving? You ask that to a child and say, how do you want your story to be told? I mean, yeah, depending on, you know, the age of the child and how it is, you know, you'll get all sorts of, you know, different answers. But a lot of the times, like, especially if the kids are a bit older, they'll tell you, you know, I want my story to be how I fought to get to this point. I want my story to be how I didn't give up and now I'm in university. I want my story to be how, you know... I lost everything and my parents lost everything and I was injured, but then I became a doctor. And when you ask actually these younger kids, you know, it, it ends up being, you know, for the little ones, it's less in the framework of what do you want your story to be as much as, you know, what kind of a person do you want to be when you get older? And it's everything from an engineer to a doctor, to a nurse, to this, to that, because the other thing, and I, I hopefully this will also resonate with your audience. Like when we're talking about social impact, the impact that we have on an individual is so critical to that individual's development. I mean, we all have these moments as we're going through life that we really remember as being 
key moments. And when we're talking about a child who has been injured, you know, by war or due to war or anyone who is actually in need, when you're able to provide them with support in that moment, that becomes a key instance that profoundly shapes their psyche and the kind of person who they become. That's can I, can I put you on a on a spot and would you share one story? One story that you know, um, I'm, you have plenty, I know, but you know, what's one story that will illustrate that for us? That you know, is a go-to story for you. Um, actually, one of the big the big go-to stories um, for me is actually of this uh, young woman, and her name is Safa. And when she was twelve years old, she was burnt. And basically, what happened is the family had fled from Syria. They were living in Lebanon. And what happens to a lot of these refugees is they're in unsafe living conditions. So she's at home with her younger siblings, and a fire starts. So she runs out of the house, saves herself, and then realizes that her siblings are still inside. So she runs back into the burning home, but as she's at the doorway, something explodes on her. So she ends up burning for 15 minutes um, as she's screaming before help actually arrived. And it turns out that her siblings were actually all okay. And so she was one of the cases that Inada treated and she's been with us, you know, for years right now. And as a teenager, you know, she had to go to school wearing this horrific mask and children would see her and they would scream and they would run away and they were, you know, very afraid. She is right now studying languages at university to be able to tell her story in different languages. She right now will tell you, you know, you might not believe me, but when I look in the mirror, I think I'm beautiful. She right now will tell you, I know that I am strong. I know that I can do whatever I want to do in life. And the thing is, is that yes, is something inside of her, but that wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to come out if she hadn't gotten the help that she needs. And I think it's just, you know, Sometimes people feel like the need out there is just so overwhelming and there's so many people who need it and how can we address all of it and that sort of a thing, which is fair. But at the same time, you know, you never really appreciate or necessarily even really know the ripple effect of what helping one family or one person within a family actually does because you help the family, you help the community. And, you know, for me, it's it's enough that we're able to touch these lives individually because I do believe that each life that we're able to touch then is going to turn around and touch another life. I mean, this might sound super cliche and naive and like, you know, let's go run in a field and pick flowers and daffodils, which is definitely not the kind of person that I am because I'm quite dark and cynical most of the time. But I do believe that, you know, there is a ripple on effect in kindness, right? Like people will remember when I was at my lowest, someone came to help me. And that will push them towards wanting to be someone who is going to then turn around and help others. Well, I don't think that's naive at all. You are in amongst a room of people who, who believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, because the power of a story like that ripples. Um, and the platform that sometimes you provide, uh, or the media provides, is the ability for the story to be told so that more people get inspired by it. Um, I would love to slowly bring our conversation uh, towards the end, getting to know a little bit about, more about you. You, you spent 17 years as a broadcast journalist. I mean, you, you left CNN um, to, to work in Inara full time. So I'm curious, like what, what led to that change? What, was that a pivotal moment? Is, that, you know, is it like a long time coming? Uh, what's that story behind the shift from journalism to what Inara is doing? So I didn't leave CNN to work on Inada full-time, actually. Um, but that's kind of what has happened by necessity. Um, I left CNN because I wanted to explore different ways of storytelling. So I actually left CNN to work on a documentary. And I kind of dove into the deep end of the documentary world and had this crazy shoot that was across six or seven different countries um, that I'm really, really excited about. It's actually coming out. Um, it's it's being edited together right now. And then at the same time, yes, so that I could sort of focus at least initially on trying to get Inada a bit more stable um, on, on as a foundation um, because 
you know, we, we needed this kind of, you know, extra attention to it because we're trying to grow, we're trying to expand uh, what it is that we're doing. But I think really fundamentally, you know, sometimes you reach a point in life where you're quite comfortable with where you are. I just knew that I had to try and see what happened when I went out on my own and kind of followed, I call it my crazy. So basically I needed to go follow my crazy for a bit. Um, And you know what, maybe it works out, maybe it doesn't, but I've always said this, you know, I'm more afraid of not trying something and regretting that than I am of actually trying and failing. Um, So yeah, we'll see what happens. Well, that's a great life philosophy, actually. We're looking forward to the documentary. Now, that would be under Scrappy Goat Media, would that be? Yes. We love that name. <laughs> Scrappy Goat Media. How did that come about? Which is... Hilar- no, you know what's hilarious about it? I have a badge from the Ukrainian military authorizing me as Scrappy Goat Media to go and cover stuff in Ukraine. I have a permission from the Taliban in Afghanistan for Scrappy Goat Media to be filming there. And I was dying laughing because I'm in, you know, the Taliban's office at the Ministry of whatever it was, Information, Foreign Affairs kind of thing where you go in and you get, you know, told what you can and can't film. And he's looking at this and he kind of goes, Scrappy Goat Media? And I just lost it there. Um, So basically, I've actually been joking for a long time that I'm going to start a production company. It's going to be called Scrappy Goat Media. And the backstory is because my name Arwa um, means in Arabic, it means, you know, something that brings relief, but it also means a mountain goat. So then my nickname was Little Goat for a while. And then one of my colleagues was trying to, I think, give me a compliment and her and her mom were talking about me and they were comparing me to their three-legged poodle, which is apparently... (laughs) which is apparently really scrappy and apparently was a compliment. And so it just became Scrappy Goat. So I've had Scrappy Goat as my nickname forever. And I just thought like so many of the places I go to are so serious. Like how funny would it be to just be there as Scrappy Goat Media because you need a little bit of humor in something. And I'm sure you broke eyes with even the folks at Taliban. It's, it's, it was pretty special, yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Hey, um, just as a final question, um, we are a bunch of crazy people here as well, trying to do some good uh, for the community that we're in. Um, what would be an advice, one, one advice? I mean, we, we all try to do what we can, what, like what you are doing now, uh, with the gifts that you have, with the experience that you have. Um, folks here in Singapore are doing the same thing. Um, what would be your advice, one parting shot, one parting advice to the 200 over leaders in this room? I would think, you know, based on my own experience, I mean, I know how hard it is to do good and I know how hard it is to help. And I know that so much of the time you really feel like you're pushing this massive boulder up a hill and no matter how hard you're trying to fight against it, it's just, it's not moving and it's exhausting. I know how tiring it is. And I think my one bit of advice would be, just don't give up. Don't stop. Sometimes you might need to readjust your expectations of the impact that you're having, but just imagine what would happen if you and your organization didn't exist. That's a good way of putting it. Awa, thank you so much for spending time with us. It has been a real, real joy speaking with you again. Ladies and gentlemen, won't you please give a big round of applause to Awa Dave? Thank you. My pleasure.